Renting in Australia at the moment is absolute madness. I've never seen a situation in housing like we're seeing today. We have millions of renters facing some of the worst rental stress uh, they've seen in their lives. The crisis we are currently facing in housing is about to get a whole lot worse. Vacancy rates are super low, rents are super high, and it's causing a rental crisis that's touching every corner of the country. So what's going on and how bad is it? In the past year, rents in our capital cities have skyrocketed almost 12%, which is the equivalent of $63 a week on the average rent. That's way above the inflation rate and even more above the usual annual rental increase of around 3.5%. If you want to rent a home in Australia today, you're looking at paying a national median of $577 a week and it's a lot worse in the big cities. That already prices out people on welfare whose weekly payments don't even reach the median rent. And it's not just hurting people on welfare. A snapshot of current listings by Anglicare found that less than 1% of rental properties were affordable for people on minimum wage. Even essential workers are struggling. Nurses, police officers, firefighters, teachers, aged care workers are all having to pay well above 30% of their income to rent a home. Some are paying more than two thirds of their pay on rent, which means more of our essential workers are being pushed out of cities to find a home they can afford and have to travel long commutes to get to work. So why have rents suddenly become so unaffordable and unavailable? The simple answer you'll hear is... One of the reasons why we've got vacancy rates so low and rents so high is we don't have enough homes. Now that's true to an extent, and it's been exacerbated by a few trends. One trend is that more of us just want to live in homes with more space. The average number of people living in each household has dropped from 2.9 in the mid-1980s to 2.5 today. We saw this trend pick up pace during COVID lockdowns, which caused a few too many divorces and breakups, and people also just opted out of share houses for obvious health reasons. The ABS says the COVID factor alone has added demand for 120,000 extra households. Another trend is the return of international migrants, particularly students. About 650,000 migrants are expected to make their way down under this financial year and next, which is adding to demand for rentals. But neither of these two trends are surprising. It's just the post-COVID reality that is hitting our rental market particularly hard. We knew people were moving to find space during COVID, and we knew international students would eventually return once we reopened our borders. But is it really just a matter of having too few homes, or have these trends exposed an imbalance in home ownership, which is contributing to our broader housing and rental affordability crisis? According to the last census, there were almost 11 million private residential dwellings in the country. But the growth in the number of private dwellings has actually outpaced population growth since 2011. So the private sector has been building more homes, but who's snapping them up? This is where the imbalance comes in. Of those 11 million homes, just over 3 million or 30% are property investments. According to the ATO, 15% of Australian taxpayers are property investors. And when we zoom in a bit further, we find that only 1% of taxpayers own roughly a quarter of all property investments in this country. So yes, while it is true that recent trends in both domestic and international migration have added strain to the rental market, they've only really worsened a problem that has long been in the making. The imbalance in home ownership might not directly contribute to existing supply and demand rental issues, but it is an important factor worth noting. So what are the solutions? Well, for one, we could just build more homes. And Labor is kind of proposing that with its $10 billion housing fund. The Albanese government is proposing to invest $10 billion and use the returns on it, up to $500 million a year, to build social housing. It also struck a deal with Jackie Lambie for a minimum of 1,200 affordable homes to be built in each state and territory over five years. It's a start, but it's still way short of the 120,000 additional homes the ABS says are currently in demand, and well short of the 640,000 affordable homes the University of New South Wales has identified are needed to meet the housing needs of all Australians. That's why the Greens are saying, We don't need billions gambled on a fund for the future. We need direct investment and help right now. Another solution is building higher density residential developments in inner and middle suburbs. You may have heard of the term NIMBYs, which stands for not in my backyard. NIMBYs in wealthy inner and middle suburbs are being blamed for opposing high density housing developments for fear of changing the character of their neighborhoods. Across many of our capital city suburbs, 
planning laws only allow you to build standalone houses. The result of this has been an endless sprawl of car-dependent, poorly serviced suburbs. Melbourne recently got crowned the largest city in Australia, but only because it's spread out so much that it now spans over 100 kilometres and it takes almost two hours to get from one end to the other. Melbourne's metro area has a lower density than LA, and this suburban sprawl is being replayed in cities all over the country. And so, voices are now growing for state governments to do more to allow for higher density developments in inner and middle suburbs. This makes sense not only for housing affordability reasons, but also because it's actually four times cheaper for governments to build infrastructure in established suburbs closer to the CBD than in new outer suburbs. And of course, one obvious solution, which no one has a political appetite to tackle, is changing the tax concessions and incentives, like negative gearing and capital gains, that have resulted in a wealthy few owning a massive chunk of our housing stock. So we know what's causing the rental crisis, and we know how to fix it. The question is, do we have the will to do so? If you like this video, I also write a daily newsletter called The Afternoon Update. It's a quick three minute roundup of the news that matters. All you have to do is sign up via the link in the description or just download our app and you'll get a notification every afternoon.